Welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Bud Elliott. That's Danny Cannell. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at YouTube.com slash Cover 3 and all across the 24-7 Sports Facebook Network. Thanks for hanging out. Smash that subscribe. Smash that like and come and join us in the chat. It is a Monday here in April. We got boatloads of spring games over the weekends and... As we pull apart all the vanilla offense and as we try to figure out, even with all the players sitting out, what can we learn? we got some headlines to come out of that one as well. Uh, lots to get into looking back at the weekend's spring games. Thanks to everybody who's already in the chat and throwing some questions out for conversation. We will integrate those throughout the show. But we begin with something that honestly, guys, it kind of snuck up on me. And I, I wonder how many players it snuck up on as well. Tax day. No, thank goodness. <laughs> it, it, tax day is tomorrow, right? Yes, I think tomorrow yes. is the deadline. Got to hope hope you got everything together. If not, it's going to be a, a long night of uh, sifting through the shoebox uh, together. But like we had thought in our show planning that the portal was going to open on May 1st and that it was going to run, we knew, for about 15 days. I've got real issues with you people, you NCAA. You moved it up, and I needed those two weeks of content, Okay. You're going to stuff all this portal action in an April when we're already talking spring games. But seriously, I like players, coaches, all of a sudden, this thing is is open and popping. What are we expecting from the transfer portal? I would say Georgia defensive lineman Bear Alexander is the most notable entry into the transfer portal. Are there any other names that stand out? And what are what's what are we looking for out of these, uh, I guess, now 13 days that are left between now and the end of the month? I mean, there's going to be like a whole wave of movement again, right? Maybe not. I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be headliners. Like Bear Alexander might be kind of a outlier as far as the like the four star, five star guys. But I do think quarterback wise, I think one we'll get to here in a little bit when we're discussing this weekend spring games. Like you're probably going to see somebody like Malik Murphy hit the portal. You're going to see some bigger names that are you know losing battles. So I, I would expect it's going to be you know kind of a a, a wave, maybe not a whole bunch of great players, but a lot of players hitting activity. Yeah, I, I think that there's a couple categories. Like you're going to have some guys who are uh, trying to test the market, right, and may, and may go back to their own school if their own school will take them. I think you're going to see uh, a tremendous market for offensive tackles. I've been reading all of our articles on 24-7 Sports. What does what our team need in the transfer portal? And uh, everybody needs offensive tackles, and they just ain't out there, right? So – Caleb Etienne of Oklahoma State just entered. He's not even good. And already, big time offers, right? Like a lot, a, lot of, a lot of teams are talking to him. Like if you ha have a pulse and you happen to be 6'6 six, six and 3'10, I mean, pressure rate allowed last year, 3%. Like that, that's in red. That, that's not great, right? But you're an experienced guy. You played all 823 snaps that Oklahoma State played last year on offense. If you have any kind of pulse at offensive tackle, you're going to make a mint because teams are just absolutely desperate out there. I mean, even if you're not good, just don't be terrible and be big, and you will be valued. So I think certain positions like that, you'll see some movement. I also think there's going to be a battle, and I was talking to a coach about this yesterday. He's like, I need to figure out if my boosters can get enough money to my studs to stay and play and be starters at my G5 team as opposed to like, what's the offer from the P5 team for them to come and be a backup, Ooh. right? Because like, if it's you know triple or five x what what my my boosters made on the scrounge up, that's probably hard to say no. But if we can get it kind of close to the ballpark, like how much does actually playing football and starting mean to you as opposed to being a backup at a P5? So a lot of a lot of little interesting storylines with this. Yeah, I think. Um... The reason it was moved up, Chip, because I was with you. I've been referring to May 1st and May 15th as that window. Apparently, the Division I Council came together and felt like it would be better served to move it up two weeks during spring football, which I don't know how that makes sense because you would think like if the div it's an NCAA group that is worried about student-athletes, maybe you'd let them finish their semester, but I guess they are worried about some um, mid-mesters, I guess, is reading about this. Is, is that um, what it is? Like the trimesters or the way, like the quarter yeah, system? Yeah, something mm -hmm. to do with. But they also referenced having it during spring football, so that like players can make the announcement now before they do go out. 
I mean, it is weird when you see Barrett Sander the day of the Georgia spring game entering the portal. Like, that is a shock to the system, a player of that caliber. And you know what else is a – by the way, I that feels to me a lot like the Jordan Addison situation where you've got a top-tier player playing at a group that is – or playing at a place that's very healthy. Like, why would you leave? There is going to be a big offer out there, and I wouldn't be surprised to see him take the same path either to USC. Um but the other thing that was interesting is I saw two coaches. Now, this was, you know, Thursday night after Florida spring game. Billy Napier said, Will your quarterback, you know, the spring, the portal's opening. Will your quarterback look room look the same? And he said, No, I expect it to look different. That is a coach, you know, publicly putting a sign that's like, you know, putting a post on um, you know, online, like looking, you know, seeking, you know, Facebook quarterback marketplace. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Not just a Jag Plus. We want a player. Uh, Mario Cristobal said the same thing after their spring game. You know, what are you, are you looking? He's like, our roster is going to look totally different week one than it does right now. Like there are coaches who are actively looking to upgrade their roster. So there's players looking. I think the other interesting dynamic is, is what Bud said. And I saw Sark said this last week. Sark took the approach at Texas, said, hey, if you enter the transport uh, transfer portal, you're done. Like you're not, you're not welcome here anymore. Once you go, you're gone. That's not going to be the approach from every every coach, you know, because they can't. They don't have that luxury. So I'll be curious what Bud is talking about. We've seen that happen before. We've seen Georgia players do that before. Enter the portal and go f- seek out offers. And some have left and some have come back because they've had offers matched or better to stay home. So it's just like the new welcome to college football in 2023. Yeah, they're out there right. looking for that Jalen Hurts money. Yeah. Danny, you're probably going to be getting a call from HQ soon. Just, just a heads up. <laughs> oh, did he just sign the a big contract? Five years, two hundred twenty-five million. Two hundred twenty-five million or two fifty-five? Was it? Yeah. Danny, does that check out? Is that the expectation? Yeah, it's the guaranteed money. That's the thing that'll be interesting to see. But two twenty-five, five years. It's probably what does it say in real? Like one hundred seventy-five guaranteed, something like that. I bet that's one seventy-nine. Good guess, dude. Yeah. yeah, it's it's weird. It's like he's got some expertise here when it comes to uh, being a quarterback. <laughs> That's why you get the call. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, well, Danny, like that was because I, I, too, saw the comments uh, on Thursday night and Friday night from the head coaches. And I would say, like, what are the other teams that we think are going to be active? Like, are there the quarterback is just such an easy place for us to focus, but there might be other positions of need and other teams that are going to be looking to tackle that. Who are going to be some of the, like, if you're a fan of Team X, who is Team X that you're like, I am refreshing this portal looking for names that can help us? So, try to think about teams that we don't have listed on the rundown because I figure we, we can just kind of wrap that in, in, into that, right? So, we, we can cut it for, for the clip. Um, and, like, I know Virginia Tech needs offensive tackles in the worst way. They have, like, one guy that's played the position. You know, like that's that's a big one. Um, Bud Elliott watched the Virginia Tech. He has seen unspeakable things. Yeah, He's watched right. the Virginia Tech spring game. <laughs> he showed up white as a ghost. I've never seen. Oh. Him. <laughs> well, let's let's throw it back to our Wednesday show when we had Cole Kublik on, right? Auburn and he was, receivers. Well, Auburn receiver for sure. Uh, he had mentioned like having some uh, some skepticism of the South Carolina offensive line and uh their their best offensive lineman their starting left tackle went down with a knee injury and it, it I, I haven't seen an update uh, i watched it a couple times this morning to try to figure out what it was he had to be carried off the field by two guys didn't look great so i mean spring game has real injuries and potentially real consequences so you got, you got we got to track some of this stuff they could be in the market for an offensive lineman as well let's do the reactionary thing should we ban spring games <laughs> no no okay. football is violent you can get you could get the same injury in a competitive scrimmage on the third totally. saturday of spring practice yeah. but i've I seen saw... guys in the first day of training camp where you're just wearing helmets and doing seven on seven and you tear your acl like you can't play scared and every coach is nervous don't get me wrong but you can't play scared you got to go out there and get your work done um, JV on Cohen, the transfer from Alabama at Miami, just like came up with a minor injury during warmups. Yeah, or, or crystal ball was like, Yeah, we really get after it before the in our warmups. <laughs> Word that, <laughs> okay, that actually happened, I think, to was it John Campbell last year in their warmups before the FSU game? 
So Miami's had multiple offensive linemen in the Mario Cristobal era get hurt during warmups because they get too into it during warmups. I, I mean, That's I'm not. I, I don't know about the reason, but yes, <laughs> kind of weird. Maybe we should reevaluate what we're doing before the game then. No, that's or, that's or maybe you just need to be built different. I mean, yeah, maybe that's, that's what it takes. <laughs> that's Mario Cristobal saying practices should be harder than the games, taking it a little too far. I mean, that, that fits. Uh, yeah, it totally tracks. Um, who? All right, so we do have a couple that are coming up later. Any other schools that you think are going to be looking for quarterbacks? Because that's another place where we've got to think the market, in a way, like you mentioned with Caleb Etienne and the tackle, like there is going to be a quarterback who is going to demand – attention, value, money, whatever, at a rate that is higher than his like performance or like his value in a vacuum. I think Auburn could use a quarterback. Mm -hmm. You know, and I mean, Hayden Wolf, Old Dominion transfer, said he wants to get back closer to home. He's from Florida. Auburn is somewhat close to the state of Florida. So maybe there. Um, other teams that need quarterback. I, mean, I think there's a lot of teams. Well, I mentioned Napier, play. right? Like Florida's an obvious yeah. one. Florida needs a quarterback. Yeah. I'm trying to think of who else. I mean, I, I well, think uh, on the broadcast, in the market. Napier said that he evaluated all 24 quarterbacks that were in the portal and thought that Mertz was the best one. So, but then he also said after what the new portal opening, if there are people on the market, would you be interested? And he was pretty open to it. Yeah, he said, yeah, we, we plan to bring in a player at that position. Mm -hmm. So Florida is. On the rundown. So coming up on the other side, let's open up the book from the spring games that were over the weekend. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, we had lots and lots of action. And we will begin with the most famous third string quarterback in the entire country. Next. The CBS Sports Galazzo Network is the first of its kind free 24-7 channel dedicated exclusively to global soccer coverage, and it is now streaming on the CBS Sports app, Pluto TV, and Paramount+. Plus. Get your morning started off on the right foot with Morning Footy, our weekday soccer culture-driven morning show beginning at 7 a.m. Eastern Time. Plus, don't miss the rest of the top-notch programming, including Box to Box in the early afternoon, live matches and re-airs, original studio shows, highlights, documentaries, and so much more. It is the CBS Sports Galazzo Network 24-7, now streaming on the CBS Sports app, Pluto TV, and Paramount+. Plus. Oh, I got to get in that Box to Box shout-out. I saw Poppy and Aaron West holding that down last week for the first uh, first week, and lots of good stuff had it going on over there at the Galazzo Network. Okay, so the the common thought, if you are a head coach and you've got a pretty good quarterback room, is that you let them battle through the spring and you say, we're going to let the competition play out into the summer. We want them competing every day. We might get to Texas A&M later. Jimbo Fisher said something like that. Let, let, every, every day going to be a competition, all right? We, go, we want them to be competing. Uh, we want them to be competing in the summertime, in the fall, and so on. But that's not what happened in Austin because Steve Sarkeesian, after the Texas spring game, announced that Quinn Ewers is the team's starting quarterback. He wins that battle with um, Arch Manning, obviously the five-star true freshman, and also Malik Murphy, uh, who was in the program last year. Now, we had gotten some buzz, and he made some references here on the podcast that, look, we are going to continue to say that Arch Manning is in this as long as Steve Sarkeesian is calling it an open competition. But we had also, and you know, hinted at it a little bit, been given the impression that if you just looked at the practice reports available on 24-7 Sports, that Quinn was out with the ones, Malik Murphy was out with the twos, and that Arch Manning was running third. And that does appear to be what we're looking at after a spring game where Ewers was very effective, where Malik Murphy looked really good, and Arch Manning looked like somebody who just showed up to college football three months ago. Like, you can find things that you like, but it seems, according to, you know, like the, the people who are the closest to this, that it is undeniable we have a pecking order at that position. So what's the fallout? What's next? Is this a good sign that Quinn Ewers has gone out and taken the bull by the horns? Danny, where are you at on this one? So I think, first of all, Sark has the luxury of being able to do this uh, because um, of where Arch Manning is in his career. 
I think it's more about trying to put Quinn Ewers in the best position to succeed. I mean, it's a unique situation where he's got so much pressure on his shoulders. Sark is aware of the movement out there that is going to be campaigning to see Arch Manning, whether it's people that have paid money <laughs> that have contributed, Texas Longhorn fans, people like us that want to see this story come to fruition. So I think he's trying to publicly back Quinn Ewers and say, this is your team. And I thought he was very refreshingly honest. He said, you know, a lot of coaches won't do this because they don't want the other guys or they're worried the other guys will stop competing. And he's like, I'm not worried about my guys. I want them to know they're still competing for something, you know, talking about Murphy and Arch Manning. So I thought he was pretty honest about it, but I think it's more about, you know, giving Quinn Ewers, which we all, I mean, he's, he's, it's his job to lose, right? I mean, he's got the experience. He played a whole season. He showed flashes of brilliance. Um, so I thought it was more of a, an endorsement of him, which does silence the critics for an off season. It's not going to silence him if he plays bad in Tuscaloosa September 9th. And I, and Sark knows that. And I still think anything is on the table once the season starts, but I do think from the team perspective, it's it's what's best for the team going forward is to know who their leader is going to be this offseason. And I thought Ewers, his comments after the game, he was very humble. Like, and I did not expect to hear that from him. He's got a new look, like he lost the mullet. He's like, hey, I let down the fans. Like, I think he's kind of realized what it takes, the pressure that's on him. And he's coming out there with the new attitude towards his role in this team and gonna, you know, is working harder to earn that leadership. And I think Sark probably sees that and is rewarding that attitude. I think it's a money year for Quinn Ewers. And just if you look at him, he looks more jacked than he was last year, kind of more business like approach. I I really do think this kid was hurt last year at times. And kind of the things we hear behind the scenes at Texas are now kind of coming more public, right? Like Sark was publicly saying it's a battle. Manning's in this thing, blah, blah, blah. Privately, we were hearing, no, he's going to redshirt. The plan is for ours to redshirt. Like, he's, th th this is not a battle, right? We had heard that Ewers played really well throughout spring, like in the scrimmages, practice to practice, that like he was playing at the level that they had hoped to get from him last year. So, I mean, that offense is, is absolutely loaded. Worthy caught the ball, which was great. A.D. Mitchell had a great one-handed grab, mm -hmm. and I think is a nice addition. Mm -hmm. Remember, they get us Isaiah Nayor, who we were really excited about last year, the Wyoming stud who tore his ACL, uh, I think, in fall camp last year. A couple other nice pieces. Cedric Baxter's a dude at running back, and he may not even start. I mean, and I generally trust Sark to call offense. So <laughs> I I think this thing is probably rolling, and I, I mean, Ewers looks like a dude. I'm just going to say what we're all thinking. Texas is back. Yep, that's that's it. Yeah. Quinn go. Ewers is the best I quarterback see. in the country, as I was saying months ago. Tom was way ahead on this. Months ago, way ahead of the curve. No, I he looked really good. I mean, and you you wrenched. He does look like he's in better shape. He looks like he's thicker. He looks like he's gonna be able to take. You know, like he broke his collarbone last year. He looks like you can't prevent injuries, but he looks at least like he's more capable of withstanding that kind of physical hits and not hurting himself. I think I know this is stupid, but I really do think cutting off the mullet is a big deal. I think it shows maturity. I think it shows that he's growing mm -hmm. up. He understands it's not. It's just. And I think you know, if you look at quarterbacks, you know, it's well, who was the last quarterback with long hair to win any a big game? Who was the last quarterback to win a Super Bowl with long hair or a national title? It's like this. It's, it's business time. Quinn Ewers realizes it's business time. He's approached it this off season. He looked great in the spring game. I do think like we'll have to see what that defense looks like still. But I think offensively, they're going to be a really fun team to watch. And I think that the other thing, too, like if Malik Murphy sticks around, they've got depth at the quarterback position because Murphy looked really good in the spring game himself. Yeah. So, like, this that's, is a situation. That's yeah, the ahead. big if to me because Arch is going to stay. He's not going anywhere. Like, he just arrived. Murphy's been there for a year. He sees Arch Manning waiting in the wings, and I know – he probably feels he's better than Arch, right? And if they watch the game tape, you'd say, oh, he looked better in the spring game. But you just have to know how this works. And we're talking about teams that need quarterbacks. I I'm sure Malik Murphy would find some suitors out there that would step up right now and, you know, come after him. So I think that, to me, is the really interesting one. You mentioned about Quinn Ewers. I think he's been humbled, which is a good thing. Like the sport, 
will humble you. Whether it's in college, whether it's in the NFL, you'll get humbled. And how do you respond to it? Some guys don't respond well. It appears now, like Quinn Ewers is doing and saying all the right things that shows he's got this renewed focus and, hey, I got to earn you know, my keep and I can't just show up and, and be Quinn Ewers, this stud from high school. So, And I think Bud's pointed out a bunch. He did not play much high school football, so he's still learning a tremendous amount. You know, he's incredibly, you know, the physical talent is there, but he still needs developed. I think, you know, he could be a big year for him. Again, Murph, I'm going to still look at this and say September 9th in Tuscaloosa. Let's see what the returns are. Not saying he has to win that game, but that to me is the game that kind of Texas and Quinn Ewer's fate will be decided. He's like gonna, if he plays, he's tear that he team plays, apart. Okay. What's that? He's going to tear him apart. Texas money line. <laughs> Bet it right He now. was. He was tearing him apart last, That's what last I'm saying. year. Texas yeah. money line. I, I think Texas can win that game. Yeah. Yeah. I, they're only I, seven, I seven they're, and a half point underdog. I thought it would be mm-hmm. higher than that. I mean, look, with, with with Murphy, he was a top 200 kid for us, right? A guy with really big physical tools. He what, broke his leg last year, so didn't get to play. I, I really trust Mike Roach, and, and like he, he sees his guys a lot, and and, and he, he saw Murphy quite a bit. He's at our Texas site, and I, I think he does a nice job. And he's like, dude, Malik Murphy is a dude. Just needs to like actually get healthy and get a chance. If you're Texas... Murphy threw absolute dimes in this game, and one of them was like probably the best throw he threw was, was was dropped. Are you happy that he played that well in the spring? Because right. I think there's a lot of teams Malik Murphy would go out and start for right now across the country. I think you pony up, you match an offer, like okay. you just you are Texas and if they did it with Worthy. They should do it with Murphy. Like Quinn Quinn Ewers injury history is enough. Yeah. Like, you know, if you really believe you've got a chance to go out and win the Big 12 and compete for a college football playoff, don't put it on, you know, somebody who had multi, like one injury that made got got you knocked out of a game that's Quinn Ewers, another injury that kind of made the ac- a hand issue that made the accuracy look a little bit funny for a game or two. You don't you don't want to lose the potential of being able to have someone who you trust to come in and go win a game. Is he going to stay though? I don't know. Like, we were just talking about it. Like, I don't think, I don't know if Malik Murphy's in a situation where he was like, you know, what, if I don't win this job, I'm entering the portal. That's not like, you know, but I think that as we were talking at the top of the show, if a team needs a quarterback like Florida, Florida just got its collect a new NIL collective. What if Florida just comes around and says, hey, we'll you give you 13 mil? That's what I'm saying. We'll give you a whole bunch of money. Like, I I don't know. It's it's just it's an interesting. I think it's important that he stays. I think if he does stay, Texas is in very good shape. If he doesn't, I think they're probably still in pretty good shape. But it's just it's that it, this is what it is. It's like the kid might not be planning to transfer, but in this day and age, it takes one phone call to change your mind. So on the arch piece of this, because I've started to change my my phrasing here, and it was from recent history. We can call it a redshirt year. I'm just calling it a developmental year because that's what we're seeing with a lot of these five-star quarterbacks is that they do play, but maybe not enough for it to trip the eligibility. And also a five-star quarterback, you might be in the NFL three years after high school anyway. Like whatever you know your eligibility is, it's not like you're trying to maximize this out and be in college for five years. And I think that CJ Stroud had a developmental year and Bryce Young, had a developmental year. Bryce Young played in nine games during his freshman season, but it was almost all mop-up duty, but that helped him get ready going through the process of preparing each week, going out there on game day, at least with the idea that you're going to be thrust out there. And who who was the offensive coordinator for Bryce Young's freshman season? Uh... It was Steve Sarkeesian, oh, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that, and that seemed to work out pretty well. And so, like, was the mentality that, Arch is always going to red shirt. That might be a good way to explain it. I think the mentality is like, we are going to put him through a process that seems to be working with other five similar five-star quarterbacks. I mean, even Quinn Ewers didn't play his first year in a college program. Like this, the idea of this sort of developmental year, I think is something that can really benefit Arch, you know, as well as benefit Texas down the line. But where does that leave Malik Murphy again? Stays. You, you're Texas, you pony up, you match an offer, and you keep your team. All you team have to do is convince him one more year, too. Yeah. Let's stay one more year, see what ha- I mean, We'll match whatever offer, let it be a one year deal. And then if you're not happy, then you can leave. That's what I would be trying to sell him. 
but devil's advocate, I'm Auburn or I'm Florida or I'm another school we haven't discussed who hasn't, you know, who, who's in the market for a QB. Okay, yeah, that sounds great. If you want to stay at Texas for another year, that's cool. By the way, do you think you're going to beat Arch Manning for the job next season? Or do you think Arch Manning is in line? So do you want to stick around another year so you could be the QB2 on the next season too? Or do you want to come here, get paid the same, or maybe even a little more, and you can get a crack at starting right away? So it's like we don't know what he's going to do. I'm not saying he's doing one thing or the other. It's just you can't sit here and say with any certainty that he's staying or he's going. It could go either direction. Right. And if you're if you're if your ultimate dream is to be a top ten pick in the NFL draft and you want to get there sooner rather than later, you ain't doing you it developing on the bench. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter if you get two or three million or whatever the number is from Texas, you want to play. But are you doing it at Florida? No, I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> <laughs> Where Anthony Richardson just played, didn't hey, play. Anthony great, Richardson might and... be the number one pick in the draft. What are you talking all right. about? Um all right. Uh you want Let's hit one more break and then we'll come back and we'll just start rolling through uh, the rest of these. It's obviously important for us to get Texas out of the way, but we've got thoughts on Georgia, Ohio State, Clemson, Florida, Miami, Florida State, Tennessee, and more next. You should stay. I didn't think that this is what we were doing. I thought I had this handled, and she shows up in my home. If you tell someone to stop calling you in the 20th time you pick up, what you've taught them is that 20 calls is what it takes. I'm not going to be ignored, Dan. I did not kill that woman, and I'm going to prove it. This is a wild game of survival. Back here on the Cover 3 podcast, NFL expert Danny Cannell called into action for the breaking news. Jalen Hurts. Um, let's let's roll through a couple of these other notable ones. Big thoughts here. The Georgia Bulldogs have two very good quarterbacks. Gunnar Stockton clearly running third here. Um, I think I mentioned this here on the show, but my impression really digging into some of Kirby Smart's comments going into the spring game was this idea that there are so many other places where he's looking for improvement before he feels like he can really grade one of these quarterbacks. They also have a schedule that could allow this. They could be playing multiple quarterbacks well into September uh, if they wanted to continue to drag the competition between uh, Carson Beck and Brock Vandegriff all the way out. Uh, you have an offensive line that's juggling a lot of pieces and dealing with lots of turnover. You've got wide receiver where you're still dealing with some development. And so I was not expecting that we would have an answer. Do you think you have an answer as to where things are looking at for the Georgia quarterback position. Yes. Ooh. Carson Beck, QB1? Yeah, I think yeah. it's Carson Beck. Yeah. He, he looked really good to me. Uh, not not that Brock did not. He did look like I, I, don't, I don't think he had an incompletion, did he? I, ooh, not that I – he might have Tom, but like I, not that it stands out to me. Yeah, it's it's I think it's funny because we we just finished talking about Texas. We've talked about a lot of QB battles. And I feel like we've of the QB battles that like the title contenders or like the teams you would consider playoff contenders. This to me felt like the most open simply because with the new offensive coordinator coming in, replacing a guy who's won two national titles as your quarterback, even though Carson Beck had the most experience, I kind of gave him the edge it still felt like this was pretty the, the most open of the competitions that we were discussing. But based on what I saw this weekend, I'm, I'm kind of with you. I, I think Vandegrift played well, but I think Carson Beck is just, especially for what Mike Bobo offenses typically try to do, I think he's a good fit for it. I think he has played well. I think his experience in it is going to factor in. And I don't think the competition's over, but I was already leaning back, and now I'm kind of just further leaning back on this one. I agree there. I mean, I, I think uh, like we had with Murphy, I, I, I totally could see Brock Vandergriff transfer. Portal? Yeah. Uh, it, it, I'm not saying it will happen now, but I... I, I but this would be the last chance to get out before to be right. on a different roster for the 2023 season. Exactly. Is, he, is this his second or third year? I can't even remember. I think he this got will be his shirt. third, right? Yeah, so it's... Yeah. He seems, I think that he would be more likely to hit the portal at this point than Murphy just because it's like the clock's ticking, man. He can't just sit on the bench for another year. He's If he's going to get in the NFL, he needs to be playing somewhere. 
2021, 2022. Yeah, this will be his third season. He was in the he was in the 2021 recruiting class where he was uh, a five star in the composite, a four star at 24 seven sports ranked as a top five quarterback in the class. Six, three, two hundred and five, ten pounds. We've always called him the more athletic option, but it's not like Carson can't run. Mm -hmm. It's not like Brock can't throw. It's not that productive. Um, But compared to each other, there's at least something going on there for sure. Um, (laughs) Somehow, like we we are in off season form here. Uh, Mags has my three year old yelling upstairs. Daddy, do we do you need anything from the store? I'm like, no, I'm. (laughs) <laughs> Buddy, I'm actually on the air. I appreciate it. All right. So my Georgia notes. Uh, I think Dominic Lovett is a major hit in the portal. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a little bit of like not skepticism, just question like how good is this dude when he gets out of the slot position at Missouri? Because in Drinkwitz offense, they force feed that slot and they find lots of ways to get him open. I think he's going to do a great job at Georgia. Uh, I was very happy to see Arian Smith look healthy. This is the guy I once bet money on against a dude from Rivals as to who would win the fastest man competition at one of these Under Armour practices, and Aaron cashed me in, which was great. Uh, I think that their interior offensive line looked awesome. Uh, One of the kind of under-the-radar pickups for Georgia was not a pickup at all. It was rather a retention of Cedric Van Pran not going to the NFL draft, and he's one of the better centers in college football. They got a lot of beef on the inside. You know, Carson's not going to run around quite like Stetson Bennett did. And I think he's going to have a nice clean pocket, especially interior of the pocket to step up into. Right. So, um, man, Georgia looks good to me. They, they, they do. I think they're going to have better explosive weapons on the outside and they, they still got that Brock Bowers guy. He, he doesn't suck. Yeah, Georgia's kind of reached that point with me where, you know, you could, you could talk about the guys who are leaving on the offensive line to go to the NFL and it's like, yeah, they got to replace them. And it's, I'm just like, yeah, well, they will. Like it's it's just kind of what they do. They they have plenty of those guys available on the roster. It's like, yeah, they might have they might need some time to gel in this. Yeah, that's that when I said that earlier about Kirby Smart, it wasn't like he was uncertain of if they had answers. It was about finding the right pieces, putting them in the right places, letting some of those competitions for the rotation really shake out. Yeah, but I'm totally. I'm saying just on the offensive line, I, I I'm probably not gonna have a concern about Georgia for a very long time. <laughs> yeah, they, they they recruit that spot fairly well. Mm-hmm. Uh, o- overall, um, also the Marius Mims kid is a stud, and like will will be a starter for them. I'm pretty sure. Uh, so I mean, defensively, like we mentioned, Barry Alexander, um, I don't think he was going to start, but I don't think he's leaving Georgia because he wasn't good for them. Like I, I had heard some things as far as like him impressing. I think this is like a you know bigger role, bigger bag type mm-hmm. situation, and. It does kind of expose Georgia a little bit if they run bad. You know, we talk about if they run good, this guy, like if they run bad and injuries mount, like that could be a little point of weakness in terms of interior defensive depth, right? But I mean, we're 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 kind of picking at nits here, right? That yeah. this team looks great. But I mean, that is important because if you look at Georgia the last few years. They have rotated heavily on the defensive yeah. line. So whether Alexander was going to be a starter or not, he was going to be part of that rotation. So if he does end up leaving and for a larger role somewhere else, like that does have an impact. Maybe not like, a, oh, my God, they're in trouble season on the line kind of impact, but it could impact him at some point in a game when maybe, you know, they wear down a little bit. At Ohio State, we did not get we did not get to see our two quarterbacks out no. there. Um, Devin, I, well, go ahead. I was going to say, Ohio State spring game, the three of us probably could have suited up. Like, there, there were so many guys that weren't playing in that game. It was just, it was nuts. No Xavier Johnson, uh, no Emeka Abuka at the wide receiver position. Um, no know, Trevion was, Henderson, no Trevion Devin Henderson. Brown, no the, the linebackers route. That's just, it's, yeah, they were missing a ton of dudes. I heard an interesting take from, um, somebody who covers the, um, the the team regularly, and this was w- the week leading into the final week of spring practice, the, the sense was that neither quarterback had separated themselves, which was different 
than what my expectations were at the beginning of spring practice. You know, I thought Kyle McCord, um, you know, his relationship with Marvin Harrison Jr., sort of his pedigree, everything was going to set up so that McCord was going to be the next one up. And what was tagged onto this, neither player had separated. They'd all shown some good. You know, they'd had a little bit of bad was that there is this immense pressure on both of these players in the wake of CJ Stroud. And that this, you know, something that at least this was a, you know, the opinion being shared that that might've played a role in, in being a little bit tight and making some mistakes. The other issue, which I think was exposed in the spring game is that this offensive line could use some help. Mm -hmm. And listen, in Ohio State's Big Ten schedule, they're not going to go up against Ohio State's defensive line often. There are a couple of teams that could give a similar type um, threat, but in this game, an intra-squad scrimmage where the offensive line looked behind the defensive line, very, very difficult for us to even get a feel on McCord, who again was not even playing opposite Devin Brown, who it was announced right before the spring game. He's going to be out for a little bit after undergoing a finger procedure. What are the big takeaways from the Bucks? The offensive line is a work in progress. I do think that they, they need – I wouldn't be shocked if they are in the portal looking for at least one tackle, if not two. It did not look great, but at the same time, I don't want to overreact because they are replacing both tackles. They're also replacing their center. So it's like they've got a lot of new guys up front, and it's the spring game. So, you know, the offensive line, when you've got that many new starters, probably not going to look spectacular, but I think they will probably be in the market if somebody that they want pops up, they would bring them in. It's It was so hard to say, though, because like I was saying, from what I saw – so many people were out and it's hard to really judge like the QB competition with McCord and Brown. Well, Brown's not playing. So I, I don't know that I truly buy that nobody has separated themselves because it is hard for Devin Brown to maintain pace with Kyle McCord when he's not practicing. Mm. So going into the summer, I just think McCord, I'm not saying the job is his, but I think he's got a significant advantage and Devin Brown is going to have a hard time kind of making up that ground. If he's not practicing. I, I tend to agree with Tom on that. I, I've, I think McCord will be Ohio State starter. I, I would put more money on Beck being Georgia starter than I would on McCord being Ohio State starter. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that they are – I think they're both favorites against the field, right? Um, Ohio State needing offensive tackles in the portal is not new. We had heard that from guys on that staff like as of October. Like the, the guys we have backing up these two dudes who are probably going to be first-rounders, they can't play for us, or at least not yet. Right. Like it's going to take a little bit. We might have had some recruiting misses there. We're going to have to go in the portal. I know on Bucknuts Morning Five, which if you're an Ohio State fan, like you got to listen to Bucknuts Morning Five. Uh, they have consistently said that they're going to go after two tackles in the portal and are definitely going to need one of them to start, if not both. So, I mean, that's like, they need tackle help. They will have problems blocking Michigan and Penn State and Notre Dame if they run the tackles out there that they ran out in this spring game. Oh, and they suffered another injury over the weekend, too. Oh, Brian Hartline. Brian Hartline hurt himself in an ATV accident. Get better, what? Brian. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Shoot, dude. Mm -hmm. Which which kind of car? Oh, man, this is... What, what's a side-by-side? -side? Uh, I'm guessing like, it's... Like a Sidewinder type thing? I guess thing? it's got like a sidecar or something. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not I was kind of thinking it would be like, 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 a, like a Gator. You guys know what a Gator is? Yes. Yeah. That'd be like a, the classic ATV. Yeah, yeah. Um, Brian Hartline, like not a four wheeler. Not a four. The the Gator has two seats in it and a little. Yeah, I, I think that's what it means. Side by side seats. If I had to guess, I, I just googled side by side ATV and these these look like Gators. Okay. Um. Yeah. Brian Hartline uh, went to the hospital after suffering an injury. His uh his side by side crashed on his like his property. His property. Yeah. Hey man, someone's having fun. Crashed. Yeah. Just like, hope he's better. I hope hope he get hope, hope he gets better. Hope uh, no, wish nothing but a full recovery for uh, the newly minted offensive coordinator there at Ohio State. Speaking of new offensive coordinators, a lot of excitement, a lot of hype surrounding the hire of Garrett Riley at Clemson. He shows up with the Broyles Award. He shows up having you know produced an offense that sent Max Duggan to New York City as a Heisman Trophy finalist. And, you know, for a Clemson offense that had really fallen off from the standard that had been established over a course of five or six years, this was supposed to be, you know, jumping back up into that top tier. Of course, you have Cade Klubnick, much hyped true freshman who showed 
sort of the best of Cade, I would say, in the ACC championship, and then maybe a little bit of a letdown in the bowl game against Tennessee. Some of that responsibility likely shared with the offense as well. Tigers offense in the spring game? Uh, hand ringing? Concern? No, no concern? I mean, it wasn't great, but... It's an entirely new offense with a new offensive coordinator and a new quarterback. So it's like, I don't think that by the end of the spring, everybody's going to be humming and firing on all cylinders. That said, if I'm a Clemson fan and I'm all excited about the new offense, I'm probably a little, uh, you know, just kind of let down from what I did see this weekend because it really wasn't that sharp. Clemson's defense will still be better than its offense, I think is fairly clear. Um, I thought Klubnik played a little bit better than his numbers showed, actually. In, in, in watching this and some of the uh both of all both interceptions were really good plays by the defense in fairness i also didn't see a lot of separation by the receivers and i i don't know man like D Dabo's bragging on the broadcast because he's, he's kind of mc in this thing on, on the crew with espn plus or Whatever I watched this on ACC Network Extra, ACC Network, right? I I did not watch this on an illegal YouTube stream with with, with all the all the, the, the stands. Yeah, okay, extra. So, there we go. Uh, I mean, he he's bragging on a bunch of guys that look like Dabo, and that aren't going to win you championships. So, where, where are the dudes? Kind of right. Uh, I don't know. Some of it them just, are sidelines. Like, look, like this is this is a Clemson team that had seven scholarship receivers that were not available in spring practice and were not there. Some of those, some of that count of seven includes a couple true freshmen that are going to be arriving um, this summer for fall camp. So they would have never been in the mix, but still multiple players who you are projecting to be starters, even not in the lineup. Like you do have Antonio Williams out there. Like that's somebody who we feel like we can count on, but for the most part, this was not the the full wealth of wide receiving options. And when you're working with an air raid offense, then that is going to be something that's going to be immediately obvious. The offensive line is also down two of what I would say are like four ish projected starters that seem to be penciled in. So if you're down two of your four projected starters on the offensive line, a handful of wide receivers, just how sharp can it be? And nothing tipped me off to the idea that there was a little bit of availability concern than Dabo's decision to pivot away from the format that he had used in recent years. Because over the last couple of years, they make a big deal of the orange white draft. You know, we're going to have CJ Spiller coach one team, Nick Eason coach the other. They're going to have a draft and it's going to be really competitive and we're fired up about it. And Dabo came out and was like, no, this year we want our, our whole first string to play together. Offense versus defense. Good on good. We want our, our, offense to be paired with our second string defense and so on and so forth because they wanted for these competitive reps to be able to get the same kind of work you would get in scrimmage like this this is a clemson team that knows there's still a lot of work left to be done for them to be able to get to where they want to get and we could have probably hint, guessed at that just based on the idea that they weren't going to turn this into the same kind of celebration of greatness that we have seen from some Cle clemson spring games in the past i think that's very fair um Clemson is still loaded at defensive tackle. And I think they will be considerably better in the secondary this year. They, they had to play a lot of young guys in the secondary last year who were highly rated kids and, and looked really good when they face other elite you know, recruits. I, I'm i not sure that they don't see a, a, a real drop off at defensive end. Like this team might have to blitz more for pass rush. So Xavier Thomas was out. Rook was out. Like, there's a couple of edge players, and they the Clemson coaches are saying that Peter Woods could play defensive end if they need him to. I, I could see that, but like Rook and and Peter Wood, Peter Woods, by the way, is I think going to be a very good college player. My concerns with him are solely NFL because he has really short arms. But like for college, I think you can get away with it. Uh, but like Rook and Peter Woods are, I mean, they're like super heavy edge. You know, like I don't know who this. Who the speed rushers are for this team if not but, xavier thomas when he's if he can be healthy yeah i mean it potentially one of their maybe one of their six five 240 pound receivers could play edge <laughs> them big old big body cadillacs let's or go telling us clemson should uh peter watch been top three player consensus uh Ooh. no we're talking about like just the new wave of the portal if i'm clemson i still think that if if a shifty little slot type shows up in that portal 
I feel like Clemson should be showing some interest just because, like you mentioned, Chip, they, they were missing dudes, but I still feel like that receiver core is all still the same guy. Like long, can run in a straight line, but when it comes to changing direction, beep, beep, beep. It's just, they, they need somebody who could do well in a three-cone drill so badly on that offense. Yes. Um, definitely something to to keep an eye on. All right, let's stay uh, – let's go ahead and stay there right in the ACC thematically. Um, but vibe check. Because here's what's here's what I'm like picking up on from the general Florida State um, environment that uh, I believe the quote was something like, "If you thought ah Matt Baker Tampa Bay Times he actually had this in in his write up he said um, he's a big fan of the show he said if you thought that Florida State was going to be a top ten team contending for an ACC championship and college football playoff there's nothing coming out of the spring game that has changed your mind does that line up with your general sense of things in Tallahassee? Yes. Um, Florida State had enough offensive linemen to field two competent offenses in this game. That's pretty rare and not something that I could have said in any of the last 10 or so years. They are uh, beyond competent at every position, I would say, uh, and pretty deep at a lot of spots, right? I mean, they like a little more depth at like safety linebacker you know, I, I think they could use an, another depth piece receiver but they are they're a pretty damn good football team I think like the questions this team I have like no questions about them within the ACC if Jordan Travis stays healthy you know uh, when you face a Georgia or you know a, a team of that caliber like how many of the guys on this roster are better than just good to very good? Like how many guys do you have that are like top 50 picks, top 100 picks? Like that's kind of, but we're really picking nits here. Like Norvell's got this thing turned around pretty quickly. I, I, I was impressed at just how, how deep and how functional he looked. Like it was clean. So have we reached the point, because I'm with you, I don't think Florida State, you can mention them as a playoff contender, and that's fine. I think they should be in that conversation this year. It's just for me, if they don't reach the playoff, it's not a disappointing season. I'm at the sit- I'm at a spot right now, honestly, where I feel like if they don't win the ACC, it was a disappointment, which considering where this program was just two years ago, I feel like that's a very quick kind of transition. Are you in that same kind of vibe area, or you, you still think yeah. that's a bridge too far? No, I think that's a similar vibe area. Um, I, I would I would maybe knock it one peg. Like if they don't at least play for the ACC, which mm-hmm. they haven't done in, in you know a long time, then I think you'd be really disappointed. I think you'd be bummed if you got there and didn't win the game. But I think if you don't get there, then yeah, like you're really disappointed given... I mean, they only have one guy in Ryan Wilson's, which you guys should check out, Ryan Wilson's new seven-round mock draft. They lost a fourth rounder off last year's team, which was a 10 win ball club. Like they got a lot of guys to come back. So yeah, I, I think if you don't at least play for it, you're you're really pretty bummed. But I agree with you. They're to me, they're more playoff contender than title contender. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, to they, make the playoff. But if you make it, I mean, TCU was a game away last year, and they were also 50 points away in that game away. But you know, most people didn't expect them to beat Michigan. I um, it's it's April 17th. We have months to be able to continue these conversations. But as a general template, I am willing to go eight, nine deep on the term playoff contender. Yeah. Oh, you I know? think it's bigger than that. 12, but not longer. No, if you get down to like the 13th best team by your own sort of eyes, that 13th best team to make is- the playoff. We should schedule that for a show later this offseason. We'll do a college football playoff contender draft. Year by year. But I'm just saying, like, in my in my head, I'm at least going to build out to most of the top 10 and feel like they've got the pieces to be able to go through this season 11 and 1. Sure. And contend for a playoff spot. Not every team you look at and says, like, that's a 12 and 0 team. It's college football. Doesn't happen. I'm just going to say it. Title game is going to be Texas and Florida State. Bang. Put it down. Print it. Print it. Print it. Do it. Both are back. Both are back. It's the 90s again in the early 2000s. And yeah, it's it's 2005, 2014 mashed together. Florida State and Texas are back. That would do ratings. Yes, that would be incredible. Um, Yeah, Flor- Florida State, sure, it is. Uh, and I'm, the very first thing you mentioned was the thing that I had on my notepad because offensive line was like the... It was the easy button to hit for complaining 
as things were falling apart under Jimbo Fisher and as things were incompetent at times under Willie Taggart, the biggest is like, how do we not have at Florida State with multiple national championships in the state of Florida? How is the offensive line play this bad? How is the depth this bad? And like, if you want to go to something very simple and in the big picture to average fans, probably underrated, Mike Norvell's done a good job of building up at the line of scrimmage on the offensive side, and that's going to make everything else easier. Alex Atkins uh, is definitely a name to know. You know like he's our offensive coordinator, offensive line coach. I mean, he, he rebuilt that room. Uh, to give an example, like Demetri Emanuel, a player transferred over from Charlotte last year, was I think like honorable mention or third team All ACC as a guard. He's fighting for his job after getting granted the seventh year of eligibility. <laughs> like they are pretty deep. They, I think they're going to have two new starters at offensive tackle who have, have emerged. And I mean, it, yeah, like they're. I don't know when the last time I could say like O line is FSU's deepest position, but it really might be like forty years. Yeah, seriously. Like. <laughs> Even 2013, we knew it like they had good, yeah. they had five studs, and the backups were like, "Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain." Right? As long. As <laughs> <laughs> um, I right, listen. Were there recruits that did Thursday, Friday, Saturday with uh, Florida, Miami, Florida State? Because it seemed like that was coordinated so that you at least could, if you were I don't a think prospect. They, did but it, it's not a terrible idea to do so um i don't think i don't know if anybody did all three but like I, all the schools definitely had had prospects there um all right so let's work backwards so friday night was miami they were in the inter miami stadium um what what do we think about the uh the new shannon dawson orchestrated tyler van dyke led offense uh, you know, we got to see Ruben Bain, the big true freshman, flash in uh, in a stadium where he played some high school football at times. I guess those would have been playoff games. That was a quote from Cristobal I picked up. What do we think about uh, about the U in, a, in what is very much like a first impression reboot year two for uh, it kind of feels like a year 1.5 for Mario Cristobal? You want a first time or me? You go ahead. Uh, okay, so I thought Tyler Van Dyke looked more... It didn't look great, but he just looked more comfortable than really at any point last year. So I think that is a positive. Uh, Miami signed two five-star offensive tackles in the class. Francis Maui Goa is a dude who was favorably comp to Panay Sewell. Uh, he's definitely a name to know. I think he's probably going to be a, a freshman starter at offensive tackle and probably the rare freshman starter who can handle it in most games. Not, not to say he won't have trouble, but I think he's the guy who they can actually insert in a lineup at offensive tackle, which is rare. Um, Ray Ray, the true, the, the true freshman is, I think going to be really, really good. That guy just has big time speed. Now, on the other hand, their outside receivers, I'm still not sold about a lot of the highlights here looked like the middle Tennessee state game where guys are fast. Yes. But also running wide the hell open. And, I'm like, eh. and then I was at, uh, I was at OT seven, the huge seven on tournament Sunday. And they're like, yeah, Miami needs corners out of the portal in the worst way. I was like, that matches what I saw. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. That, for those who don't have uh, all the harrowing memories of Miami's five and in seven season in 2022, the so, Middle Tennessee game, when he's talking about players running wide open, those are Middle Tennessee wide receivers uh, running wide open against yes. Miami's defense that you're yeah. referencing. I, they're at a point where I really think like taking some guys from the G5 who are a comp, like just players who know what the heck they are doing defensively. Maybe not to come in and start, but at least to like to come in and push some of the starters, probably helpful. But they also had a lot of guys out, right? Oh, in the chat, yeah, CJ Carr looked really good. I thought at, at the seven on that. That's Notre Dame's uh, commit, Lloyd Carr's grandson. Uh, Notre Dame fans should be should be pretty excited there. I think he looked good. I didn't see a snap of a Miami spring game. You said it was played at the Inter Miami Stadium. Yeah. So right by the office. Yeah. You it's better than they there? used to have it at the high school. So. I'm well, yeah. Inter Miami Stadium is. How do you how do you call it? Is it DVR I Pink? I don't know. It's a bunch of letters, <laughs> and I'm sure it's international. That's Drive Pink, isn't it? Like like the the rental car thing. That would be that would make a lot more sense. Okay. DRV Pink, yeah, Drive Pink. Is that the name of it? I thought so. All these all these companies dropping vowels. What <laughs> happened to vowels? Family show, so I'm not going to make the joke that popped into my head. <laughs> oh yeah, don't do that. Um, okay, so then what about back on Thursday? Um, Florida, I think they averaged 1.2 yards per play. I don't know. That's not a correct statistic, but it's not good. Um, where, where? I might be correct in the first half. 
That, <laughs> it's, I, I pulled it from somewhere. So at one point, they were averaging about 1.2 yards per play, and I don't think anyone was in double digits by the time we got to the fourth quarter. Now, scoring in these types of situations can always get a little bit funky, and of course, the offense is going to be vanilla. But where does Florida go from here? Well, it can only go up. That's the that's let's look at this half glass full. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I don't know. It's if I am a Florida fan, I was not overly optimistic going into the offseason after the Rashada thing and then ending up going after Michael Pratt and ending up with Graham Mertz. I was already kind of scared. And then after what I saw in the spring game, and again, you never want to take too much from the spring game, but who uh, I'm not super excited about anything I saw. Let's leave it at that. So I thought when Mertz had time to set his feet and knew where to go with the ball, he threw it really well, which is not an incredibly high bar, but I, the, the throws he made when he was decisive with it and ripped it, I thought were pretty good and Florida dropped a couple of them. Um, receiver wise, I'm not sure they have a lot of difference makers on that, that football team. Pearsall is the best guy. I think that if Pearsall is your best guy, it probably says something about you. You know, they'll, they'll need some of their young guys to step up. A Andy Jean had, had a couple nice catches later in the game. It's true freshman to know for them. My, my concern continues to be offensive line, right? I mean, you're losing the best guard in the draft and a tackle who's going to be drafted in, in Richard Oriage. You lost two transfers to USC. I don't know if you guys caught this, but the one transfer from Florida just went out there and yanked or USC's starting left tackle's job. Mm -hmm. Cortland Ford is in the portal now, all right, because he lost his job to the guy who was starting at Florida. So Florida fans in our comments constantly tell me, bud, those guys sucked. Well, they went to a better team than you and won starting jobs on those teams. So I'm questioning really how bad they are. And I, I mean, I think they would love to have a player right now like Josh Braun, who was their top backup but he transferred to Arkansas to start really early in the cycle before all this other transfer stuff went down. And then Cam Waits tore his Achilles. We don't know if he can play this, this fall. And Michael Mazuka, the, the kid that I think we all liked a lot from Baylor, the, the transfer guard, he apparently had a shoulder procedure. So we don't know if he's going to be back. Like, I am really questioning Florida's offensive line here. Not in like a 2022 Virginia way, but as of now, I think Florida's offensive line has a major drop off from where it was unless they get some of these guys back healthy or emerge because uh, yeesh something think... positive the two transfer d line they took i really like I, I thought they hit on those guys from memphis and louisville and those guys are going to be impact players from them going back to the offensive line like it's probably not going to be as bad overall as virginia's offensive line but the defensive lines that'll be facing every week are going to be much better than the ones virginia was so that could be the problem <laughs> Yeah. I just, I'm not, I, again, I don't want to take too much, but from what I saw of that game, I'm just like, ooh, I don't, I don't have high hopes for Florida this year. Would Brock Vandegriff go to Florida? Would you want to? That's, I, or would I, you rather sit and, and start for one year at Georgia? Same at Malik, same with Malik Murphy. I would rather, I would rather can sit, I would rather stay right where I am than walk into a place where I'm going to be running for my life. A, a bad offensive line, like Will Levis to, goes pro immediately after the 2021 season, and he is drafted higher than he will be. Now, some of that might be from some of the discoveries that have been made in the postseason analysis and in the combine and uh, pro days and everything else, and Ryan Wilson did a great job of it, it, describing uh, a lot of what it was like around Levis during his, uh, his pro day, but I think... I think that if you're trying to think about your future, I'd rather stay put. I think, I mean, he couldn't, but I think if Will Levis had the chance to enter the draft last year, he, there's a good shot he would have been the first QB taken because it was a terrible QB class. Oh, I don't think that's, that's not controversial. Easily. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Sam yeah, Howell, probably. the kid from Pitt. Uh, Come on, don't talk about Kenny Pickett like the kid from Pitt. That man played nine years as a Pittsburgh Panther. Malik. Heisman finalist. Let's go. Uh, all right, let's, let's let's run through a couple others right here. Um, oh, yeah, Tennessee. Joe Milton, good. Nico, also good. 
Tennessee have the best quarterback room in the SEC? Second. Second? LSU. Yeah. I like that. I, I think LSU knows it has a stud in Nussmeyer, and that's why Walker Howard transferred out. But top two. Yes, I think so. I'm trying to think of the other QB rooms. If you wanted to make a Georgia argument, that was another one that came to mind. I overlooked LSU, but that's a really good pull. I don't know if I would put – yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm as convinced that Tennessee's number two, honestly. I mean, I, we, we've talked about Joe Milton so much, but we need to – we've seen Joe Milton in his starting roles before, and he lost the job. So I, I don't know how – you know. What is Joe Milton besides a really strong arm? To this point, we're not 100% sure. But, yeah, no, I think uh, I'm getting lost in the weeds here. Sure, yeah, second best by far. That's Sorry, good. Jordan. Sorry. <laughs> um, all right, what about there was a ton of, of spring game action. I wanted to at least go open floor here. Um, but who really stood out or what's the team you want to spotlight? Uh, so I'm going to go Penn State here. Uh, that that freshman class they had last year that had a lot of young studs in it. Drew Lahr, obviously, a quarterback. Thought he made some really impressive throws. Numbers were okay, not great. Uh, they're going to, I think, really need um, – oh, shoot. Is it Cephas, the, the, the Kent State transfer? Yeah, that's Cephas. Yep, that's right, Cephas. Yeah, because North Carolina got Walker, Penn State got Cephas. Excuse me. Um, I think they're going to need when, when he arrives in the summer for him to be an impact guy. But I like what I saw out, out of Drew. And then Penn State had a lot of really impact guys in that freshman class who they're going to need to step up in the front seven. And I think they're going to – they're going to have that. Like they, they had some guys wrecking shop there. So, uh, I guess all of them trying training. to get their five star quarterback killed. Dude, Manny Diaz is going to get a job. That's what like, I'm saying. That's what I've been if, hearing. Yeah. Like, that Penn State defense is, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be a good unit. That's good. Like Penn State's defensive front is going to look really good. And Manny Diaz is going to get praise because of how that defense plays this year. It's, um, good. That's a good thing for Penn State. Going into uh, going into a 2023 season with a lot of excitement for sure. Tom, uh, shout out to Mike Collins at Virginia. Yes. One of, yep, one of the victims from the on-campus shooting there at Virginia is one of the survivors. And he was back playing in the spring game, scored a touchdown on a one-yard run. Just great to see him back on the field. I don't care about anything else there. Yeah, the um, that was the one uh, ACC team that had its spring game on linear television. Mm -hmm. And it makes total sense because that team has not been together playing in front of its fans in a competitive atmosphere um, since the tragedy. And so for them to be able to have that, I I hope it was healing. And certainly for Hollins to be out there and scoring a touchdown was a, a cool moment uh, for all the fans. I thought that Connor Wegman was going to be Texas A&M's starting quarterback. And he may be Texas A&M's starting quarterback. But all of the comments from Jimbo Fisher coming out of the spring game certainly indicate that Max Johnson is right there. Does that come as a surprise to you all as we enter the summer? It does because, like, what recruits are told about the future of the program, I think Wegman sold pretty heavily there. So, yeah, that, that does surprise me some. No, because that playbook is 75,000 pages long and it takes time to learn it. So nobody's been able to take the job yet. It's like, you know, reading War and Peace. Have you finished it yet? You can't write the book report until you're finished with it. Oh, yes, you can. But that's another <laughs> <laughs> Well, now with Chat GPT, you can write anything without doing anything. Um, that's like, I, I, I know that Max Johnson at his best, and this is, you know, something I say a lot, like I could put together a highlight reel that has you understanding why he is right there in the running. I thought that the way that Connor Wegman took that job over, which injuries, you know, elsewhere played a big role in that. I, I thought that that was the turning of the page that was handing the offense over to the very talented freshman. And he got all those games down the stretch. He had the fantastic performance against Ole Miss. It was in a loss, but you know, four touchdowns, zero interceptions, 300 some odd yards passing. Didn't quite have that much workload the rest of the way. But I, that was one of those things where, again, you've got your notes about a team, about a quarterback battle going into the weekend, and then you're following up on the game, you're following up on the press conferences and some of what the coaches are saying. And it's, uh, 
it seems like it's a battle. So it'll that that was one thing that stood out to me a little bit more of a surprise uh, than than anything else. Anything else we want to hit before we get out of here? No, I I think that's pretty much everyone. I, I watched a couple more, but I'm, I'm pretty good. Did you watch? Uh, I have. All right, so here's what's left. I I have not watched because USC was this weekend, right? Yeah. I have not watched USC. I've not watched UNC. I've not watched Ole Miss yet. Is there anything else that should be on my watch list that you have seen? I want to watch Mississippi State just because I have no idea what they're going to look like. Mm-hmm. Georgia Tech, I guess. Um, we'll see. I'll let that one shake itself out. Yeah. Check. <laughs> Love you, Brent. I'll check back with you in July. <laughs> South Carolina, we already hit. Like that's the one takeaway I had there. I, I think they'll be okay at tight end. Actually, uh, they lost Jaheim Bell, but I think Trey Knox will do, do a nice job. And then the kid they got from Arkansas. All right, let's go. Uh, some questions. Uh, Jason says better chance to get their offense sorted out: Auburn or Florida? Auburn. Is that a Hugh Freeze versus Billy Napier? Not even that. So much. I mean, I think Auburn's got a better offensive line. Um. I'll go Florida because they're in the East. That's a win loss thing. I'm going to go with Auburn based on based offensive on coaching. Yeah, based on offensive coaching and like Hugh Freeze is going to make. Um, I mean, Hugh Freeze like, has he, been he's able to yeah. make chicken salad out of it. You know, okay. like you give me whatever pieces I need, I can cobble together some explosive plays. I feel to more my, confident in that. To my point earlier about how even like yeah, offensive tackles are getting offered by big time programs. Jaden Muskrat was the second best offensive tackle on Tulsa last year. Dylan Wade, this just popped in my head because I saw the text earlier in the show. Dylan Wade was Tulsa's left tackle. Jaden Muskrat was their right tackle. Dylan Wade is actually going to be a pretty good player for Auburn this year, I think. Jaden Muskrat allowed a 3% pressure rate in the AAC at Tulsa. He just happens to be big and played 730 snaps. Like He's not actually great. He's going to be one of the more heavily pursued players in this cycle because there's just no good tackles in the portal to, to kind of bring this full circle as we talk about Auburn and Penn State just offered the kid, right? Like, Aiden Muskrat is a fast-talking and faster-shooting man, and you don't want to cross the wrong side of him after 4 p.m. I mean, what, what do you think the odds are that that Tulsa had two really good offensive tackles on their team last year? Hi, Tulsa, the team that missed a bowl? Muskrats are kind of undersized for the position, but they're tenacious, so I, I believe it. Jeff asks, how many SEC teams would Brock Vandegrift start for? I mean... Alabama. Possibly, yeah. Possibly. <laughs> LSU. No. Auburn. Possibly, I think yeah. so, yes. Yeah. Texas A&M. Possibly. No. Arkansas. No, he needs he's still got to read War and Peace. Arkansas. <laughs> no, KJ Jefferson is the starter there. Yeah, I'm not a believer in KJ to the extent Tom is, but I would agree with Tom. Florida? Yes. Mm-hmm. Tennessee. Possibly. Possibly. No Sorry. way. No way. This is I, a floor ceiling argument. Milton has an incredible ceiling, but the floor is still really low until proven otherwise in actual I mean, games. He could throw the football 30 feet through the floor for sure. But um, Missouri. Yeah, very yes. good shot, I think. So, yeah. yeah. Brady um, Cook and Garcia. Yeah, possibly. Kentucky. If Leary's healthy, I don't think that they, they would start Vandergrip over him. South Carolina. No, no, I think Rattler's better. Ole Miss. Dart looked really good from what I've read about the spring game. I have not watched it yet. I would say probably not because there's like seven guys he's competing with already there. It's just too just the market. It's just too, too congested. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just, just don't think the odds really uh, really favor that. Um, and finally, Vandy. Yeah. He yeah. could earn that job. Yeah. He'd have to compete though. All right. Mm-hmm. So that's what you got to do out there. Yeah. It's not all of them, Jamie. I appreciate the chat, but uh, this, there, there are 
Brock Vandergriff is good enough to deserve consideration at a good portion of the SEC. Whether he decides to do that or remain in Athens yet is yet to be seen. He's got 13 days until we close up this transfer portal window. So be sure to keep tabs on all that. We got you covered at 24-7 Sports. We got you covered at CBS Sports. And of course, as always, on the Cover 3 Podcast. We will be back Wednesday, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. The Dodd father, Dennis Dodd, is going to jump in to discuss uh, coaches on the rise. A little Jaden Rashada talk, some Pac-12, Deion Sanders, and of course, the spring game and transfer portal action that surrounds us all this time of year. And you can follow him on Twitter at Tom Fernelli. You can follow him at Bud Elliott 3 You can follow me at Chip underscore Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Happy early birthday, Pooch. See ya.